to the audience. To the audience. Should we do a screen test? Should we do a sound test? Okay. It's all good. Are you going to? Have, I have to turn. Have right? you turned on? Is it Andrew all right? Oh. Hello. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please forgive us. This live streaming to the world on uh, Facebook is, is so exciting, you know, to have so many people all over the world wanting to listen to this remarkable woman's story about how she transcribed Anne Lister's diaries. And I am the least technical person in the world, but I think we've, we, we have to start at 3.30 just because that's when they'll be turning on in Australia and Boston <laughs> and, <coughs> and Los Angeles. And I was saying to Helena earlier on to have worked so hard and so long and tirelessly on that transcription, never guessing, I'm sure, that, um, you know, that the world would then become aware of Anne Lister and the story, and that it would be brought to the screen by the wonderful Sally Wainwright in Gentleman Jack. <coughs> and it, 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 somebody who did that work I did say that sometimes people nowadays, you think they write a book and they've already thought, I might get a film, <laughs> I might get a TV series, but in your wildest dreams, I don't no, imagine not like this. Not ever. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very select um, group today because we could have sold these tickets three times over. Angela is going to do, Angela, sorry, I knew yes, I'd say that. No, Helena, Helena is going to do another talk in July and they've had to keep moving the venue to take account of the numbers who want to go. So there's going to be another talk at Halifax Minster yes. in July. Yes. But I'd like to welcome you to Holmesworth House. We feel privileged to have her here. For my sister Kim and I, it's particularly moving because Helena knew our mother mm -hmm. when they were girls, and um, Rita, Rita, yes, Rita, and has been able to tell us some stories about her wild escapades <laughs> in her youth. Rita's which is not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you never really ask your mother about those things. No, you don't. <laughs> so it's nice no. to have somebody else tell us. Um, she doesn't need an introduction. We know what her work entailed. We're going, I'm going to ask Helena to start telling us about how she got involved, what her work involved, what she found so fascinating about it. We're then going to break and have tea, because I'm sure you'll all be looking forward to eating and having a cup of tea, and then do a Q&A after tea. So there'll be plenty of time to ask questions. And there will be plenty of time to get one of Helena's books and to get it signed and have another chat. So I would just like to say welcome, Helena. Thank <laughs> and thank you for coming, all of you. or 36 years ago, I took a stroll down to the Milo local archives looking for a subject to write about. I knew that Anne Lister, um, who would live at Trillian Hall, was quite a notable figure in her day. In fact, the whole family was. And um, I did know that some of her letters were down there. And I thought, perhaps I could write a short article, <laughs> optimistic, <laughs> about this woman. And I didn't know anything about her at all. When I went into the archives, I thought, um, I knew that she had some letters down there, so that there was this young man, the archivist, and um, I said, could I have a look at the letters of Anne Lister, please? And he said, yes, and he put them up on the reader printer for me. But in those days, they, they would write across the, the, the page like that, and then they would turn it round, and they would write across the original writing. So you have this trellis-like 
uh, letter. And uh, the reason was that in Anne's day, the people who received the letters paid the postage. And um, the postage was determined by the weight of the letter. So they didn't want to write bulky letters, they would use the paper twice. And so I said to him, that looks quite, quite difficult. And he said, did you know she kept a journal? Did you know she <laughs> kept a journal? Seven words. 35 years later, from those seven words, we're all here. I said, would you put the journal up on the reader printer for me, please? Which he did. And I saw that a lot of it was written in an esoteric code which was much more difficult to read than the trellis letters. And um, I was putting this poor guy through the third degree by this time. Uh, have you got a copy of the code? And luckily he had. So he photocopied um, a copy of the code for me. I took 50 pages of the photocopies of the journal home with me. And I began my marathon, if you like, um, investigation into the life of this remarkable woman and Lister. Um, it took me a little while. I, I, lived in, I was born in Halifax and um, Anne Lister had lived in Halifax in, from 1791 uh, until, well she died in Russia actually, but um, I, I thought this wonderful woman was walking around my own hometown, but she was keeping the secret. What, what is the secret that she was hiding? in that day and age, in this, in this code. I took the journals home, and I had to learn the code, and then I had to start to transcribe, symbol for letter, symbol for letter, symbol for letter, and work through all the transcripted um, extracts. The journals run over 27 books, 6,600 pages, and almost five million words. And a lot of it in the code. It took me five years to work my way through these journals, extracting um, sense from the coded extracts. Um, and of course, I, I also read the plain hand, as she called it. She called her ordinary writing plain hand and her coded writing crypt hand. It gradually began to emerge um, what she was hiding. And um, I knew that she was very fond of this woman that she kept writing about, Mariana, but it gradually dawned on me that in fact she and Mariana were having um, a sexual love affair. And that was on this the secret. Goodness. Did you, did you ever think of giving up? That was such a daunting task. You, you didn't know at the time it was going to be so daunting. I didn't know. know. And did, were you ever tempted to say, I can't do any more. No. No. <laughs> One. It, was, it was more like a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember, some of us may, when you went to the cinema and there was, what did they call her, something white? She was a film star and it used to leave you. She'd be laid on a railway line bouncing <laughs> and the train would be coming and you have to wait till next week. Yeah. Well, that's just how I felt. What's she going to do next? What's happening next? So I had to go to work. I was a teacher. And I had to wait till Friday night and get to the archives, get my 50 pages, and then spend the next week extracting from that the next episode, what was going on. <laughs> At the end of five years, from the extracts that I got, I had enough material for two books. And um, this was my first one, although it, it was named uh, I Know My Own Heart, the, the first edition, but this is a much improved edition. Um, when I sent my manuscript to Virago, I'd included the whole, um, I'd included a lot more than is in that book. And Virago said to me, you've got to cut the book down, I want you to take parts of it out. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. What I will do, I will lift the whole Parisian episode out, where she was having an affair with a young woman in Paris. And uh, I made my second book out of the episodes that I, that I lifted from this book. And my second book is called uh, No Priest But Love. Unfortunately, that's out of print, but it is available on e-books e for those of you who have Kindles. So um, out of that five years labor, two books emerge. Um, and th this woman, this Anne Lister, yes. we, we've now all got to know 
to a gentleman chap that you perhaps didn't know before or you hadn't seen Helena's book, who was a remarkably modern woman was I <laughs> before yes. her time. I like to think she was a strong-minded Yorkshire woman, because we are. Yes. And was was good about speaking it. Was that apart from her um, relationships and her love affairs? That side of it must have fascinated you as well. It absolutely did. She she was a woman of great courage. Uh, she would never deviate um, from from her, if you like, her lesbian personality. Uh, she wasn't afraid. She would she would live her life uh, out and flamboyantly, if you like. Um, her lesbian credo uh, was, I love and only love the fairer sex, and thus be loved by them in turn. My heart revolts from any other love than theirs. And she remained true to that to the end of, to the end of her life. But um, th that was courage, and, and um, she had the courage to defy convention. For instance, her decision to wear entirely black clothing that was in 1817, when she would be 26. Well, given that in that era, uh, that the colour predominantly for young unmarried women in their clothing was white, and for Anne to adopt black clothing, that gave a signal to, to um, the world, if you like, or the small world of Halifax. I am not like the rest of you. I am not marriageable, you see. So it, it was in those, ways that she defied convention. Uh, that was what I call her overt statement of, of displaying her different sexuality. And when she wrote her diary, so in code was to cover up her, the love affairs, what she felt for other women, because she knew that could be scandalous. Mm -hmm. But her arguments with the Rawtons or with the men of the town, were they also in code or were they in... Plain hand. Plain hand. Plain hand. Um, unless she was saying something scurrilous, <laughs> they would be in plain hand. But if she wanted to vent, shall we say, uh, or say something nasty, um, one of the things that enthralled me about doing the journals actually was her wonderful language. We might write in our journals if we're being catty about somebody, oh, she'll never know that I've written this. <laughs> but Anne, in her wonderful language, would write, um, she will not wean this ink shed of my pen. <laughs> well, you know, those phrases were so marvellous, and, and it was that as well that keeps you interested. Uh, uh, the lovely language that she uses, the way she, she expresses herself. And the code is made up of? Yes. Symbols? Yes, and yes. Could you tell us? Um, first of all, the vowels, for instance, are numbers as we found out, I found out, after a lot of thinking about it. Uh, but she didn't say A equals 1, E equals 2. No, A equals 2, E equals 3, you know, and so on. Then there were Greek symbols, and then there were symbols that she made up herself. For instance, if she wanted to talk about Mr. Rawson, the Mr. would be two C's back to back, like that. Now, if it was Mrs. Rawson, two C's back to back with a line through. If it was Miss Rawson, two C's back to back with two lines through. So it, it, it was that, you know, that way that you could, you could interpret, if you like, some of the symbols as you went through. Because that code had been cracked by her descendants, hadn't it? But they yeah. hadn't transcribed oh. much of it. No, well they did transcribe all of it. The story of how the code was cracked um, was that the last Lister at Shibden Hall, John Lister, um, had been reading the journals, the plain hand, for a long time. And some of it, he'd put the to write about the local politics or, or uh, the weather or what was happening in Halifax town, which he could write all that in plain hand. But the code baffled him. And he and his friend, Arthur Beryl, I think if you look there, you can see some of the code put up on the screen. Yes, it's gone back to plain hand now. Yes. Um, but he and his friend, Arthur Beryl, who was a school teacher in Bradford, decided, Arthur Beryl said, I'm going to take two of these uh, journals home tonight 
and I'm going to try and find some clues. We'll try and crack this code. So he took the journals home and he came back the next day very excited and he found a clue. And in her plain hand, Anne had written, in God is my, and then there were four symbols, and it could have only been O. In God is my hope. So they had H, O, P, and E. And they worked through the night, and at the end of the night, they had cracked the code. When they started reading uh, the Crypt Hand, they, what they found was so shocking to them that Arthur Beryl said, we must burn the journals. But luckily for us, John Lister was an antiquarian, and he said, no, this is a valuable historical document to him. And he hid them behind the panels in Tudor Hall, and they laid there until his death in 1933. And he never wrote a, a, another word about Anne Lister, crypt hand or plain hand after that. So what happened to them in night when they were discovered in the room? Well, what, what happened was that um, in the 1890s or late um, 1900s, um, John Lister went bankrupt. And we had a, a philanthropist in the, in the town, a Mr. McCray, and he bought the land, Shibden Estate, and the house, and he gave, um, he gave the, 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 the land that we now know as Shibden Park, he gave the land to the town for the use of the townspeople. But he said that John Lister could live in the house until his death. Well, John Lister died in 1933. But then the house had to go into the town council's uh, custody. So, of course, the house had to be cleared out. And um, there was the chief librarian of Halifax, uh, was Edward Green. And his daughter, Muriel Green, uh, she was wanting to do a dissertation for her librarianship. So, um, Edward said to her, why don't you go to Shibley Hall, uh, gather the papers together, um, and catalogue them, and that could be your, your dissertation, working on the Shibden Hall papers. So, of course, she went up there, and of course, the, the journals emerged as, as, uh, as the workmen were working around, and um, she found them. But as she said then, um, I didn't write anything about the journals. We didn't talk about such things in those days. <laughs> so Muriel did her dissertation on Anne Lister's letters. Meanwhile, um, the journals had been put down into the local archives. Now, Edward Green knew that Arthur Beryl, who was still alive, had a key to the code. And he wrote to Arthur and he said, could you let us have a key to the code? And at first, Arthur Beryl said, no, I can't, it's too shocking. So anyway, he relented and he said, yes, I'll let you have a copy, but when I give you yours, I'm going to burn mine. So he sent the copy to Edward Green and, and Edward kept it locked in his safe, the li chief librarianship, and it lay there for another 20 years. Until in the 50s, um, Dr. Phyllis Ramsden and her colleague, Vivian Ingham, decided they would like to try and decode the transcripts, uh, the coded extracts. And um, they, they worked through it, but they weren't going to be allowed to publish any of it. But I'm afraid that um, Dr. Phyllis Ramsden was a little, um, what shall we say, um, a little um, devious, is, might be the word. Uh, she said, um, the coded extracts are so dull and boring as they cannot be any use to anyone. No. Well, of course, the coded extracts were dynamic, actually, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely dynamic. Uh, but Vivian Ingham redeemed this a little by saying, anyone who wishes to make a serious study of Al Lister uh, must not uh, neglect the coded transcripts. But even so, in the 50s, they, uh, they, were, they were banned from publishing the material. So once again, Al Lister languished in obscurity in the archives and then I'm afraid I came along <laughs> okay. and I thought this was 1983 and um, I found the journals as I've told you and of course when I realized what was going on I thought to myself this is this this has to be published really has to be I'm not saying that there weren't any moral qualms about 
letting the cat out of the bag, as it were. The Lister family had been held in high status in the town, and I'm afraid I was going to expose the skeleton in the closet. But, um, you can excuse the word closet, but you know what I mean? <laughs> she was definitely in the closet, let's put it that way. <laughs> and I'm afraid I brought her out. And that is the beginning. And this is the conflagration now, here with Sally Wainwright's wonderful series. I must admit, I've been in obscurity for 35 <laughs> years, and it was nice. Oh, <laughs> but it's uh, my cover has been blown. <laughs> what do you, you must, uh, working on those diaries all those years, you must have had an image of Anne Lister in your head. Absolutely. Apart from the portraits, yes, yes, I know. They're not very, not very flattering of her. No. The ones I've seen. No. How does Saran Jones's interpretation? Do you want to be honest? <laughs> uh, Saran is is wonderful, isn't she? She's wonderful in the part. When it was first, uh, it sort of revealed to me it was going to be Saran. I thought she's wonderful, but she'd been in so many. So many uh, lovely series. Steve McDonald's wife, wasn't she in Coronation Street? <laughs> and then she was in Scott and Bailey. And Dr. Um, then she Dr. was in Dr. 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 Foster. That was wonderful. <coughs> and then um, and I know that Sally, Sally, she attaches, she becomes attached to certain um, actresses, I think, and thinks, yes, she'll be good for that part. And I thought, I, at first I thought I wondered if uh, overexposure, mm. but no, no, I was wrong. She, I think she's absolutely wonderful in the party, Saran, yes. Um, How interesting. I, and I said, I said to Saran when I met her, I said, I'm having trouble now, Saran, because I don't want you to dislodge my Anne Lister in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I'm working now on a huge biography of Anne Lister. Um, I've just finished volume one. Um, just preparing the proposal uh, for publishers, hopefully. And um, I, my image of Anne Lister, I should, is it now going to be replaced by Saran Jones? Yes. <laughs> Which wouldn't be a bad thing in a way, but I still, I still love my own, my own um, image of her, let's say. Yes. I think we've all known that, haven't we? You read a novel and you adore it and the characters are very real to you. And then you go to the cinema and it's sometimes it's just not right. But, but I've felt that with Saran. No, but um, I've still got Anne, Anne Lister. Your Anne Lister. Yes, in the, in the background. And I bring her out when I sit at my computer at my desk, which I do every day. Um, she comes trotting back in. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Sally's interpretation? Because we all, you know, Sally Wainwright, um, Last Tango in Halifax, I have to mention, because a lot of the second series was filmed here, and that was hugely popular in the town. Oh, yes. Happy Valley, which yes. is another side yeah. of, um, of Calderdale. But then to be able to turn her hand to reproducing the sort of dialogue from the mid-19th century, yes. obviously based on, has that very much worked for you? Do you... Yes, I can spot a few modernisms, shall I say. Yes. yes. I think one of them was when um, Anne Lister was in bed with Anne Walker, and did she say something to Anne Walker like, do we know each other, or do you know me, or something like that? What was it, Rachel? Yes, yeah. But anyway, uh, just now and again, you know, you can just, um, uh, just pick it out. And of course, Sally herself said, that 90% of it is fact and 10% is fiction. For instance, nobody ever fed the father to pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Anne's oh. lifetime. <laughs> oh, I, so, think, I think the one thing Sally has got, which I've noticed in all her, she's got the most amazing ear for local talk, whether it's contemporary. She just picks things yes, up and we all think, oh, we've heard our grandmother, we've yes, heard no. that. Yes. Well, Sally, of course, was born um, in and around Halifax. She went to Sorby, didn't she? Sorby, um, Sorby Bridge School. Yeah. And uh, she said from the age of nine, she was, she was writing dialogue, picking it up from what she heard, gossip with her parents or, or, or neighbours and that. She would go home and write it down. So from the age of nine, she was writing dialogue. So, um, so I'm not surprised that she's so 
um, a debt. She, it reminds me sometimes of Alan Bennett, who says oh, he used yes, to go round oh, on upstairs, God, top yes. of the Leeds bus, and yes. listen to people's conversations. And that's why they get it just right. spot on, don't they? they get it right. Alan Bennett is, is wonderful. He really he is. is. Yeah. So dry and sardonic. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Another Yorkshireman. Another Yorkshireman. Absolutely. So how did you meet Sally? How did that come well, about? That came about round about the year 2000. 2001, so I've known Sally a, a, a long time. Um, she, um, it was Jill Livingston's book, of course, um, Female Fortune. Sally likes to write about very, very strong Yorkshire women. And um, in Jill's book, of course, it, that is concerned with Anne's business life and, um, uh, you know, um, developing land, uh, coal mines on the estate, beating the Halifax businessmen. She was a nap hand at that, she really was. Nap hand, I hope the Americans realize what that means, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so it, was always, it was always female fortune. And of course she knew about, about my books and uh, she wanted to meet me one evening. Uh, so I, I met her at the Shipping Mill Inn and um, we got on really, really well, and um, she came home with me really because over the years um, that I was doing the Alistair work, of course, I was collecting, remember, 50 pages a week, and I was archiving it at home. So at home, I have 27 boxes, and in each of those boxes, there is a, a whole photocop every single photocopied page of the journal. So um, if somebody says to me, what happened on the 13th of February, 1834? I just get the 1834 box out, get to the 13th of February, and I've got it, do you see? Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't need it, you don't need a computer. <laughs> no, no, not really. And in the box of the heavy, I'm getting old <laughs> as well. <laughs> don't, ever, don't ever think in academics life it is, is, um, uh, it is all sitting about just writing. It isn't, believe me. Lifting the box. Going yes. down to the archives, you know, it's very, very active, yes. Yes, so, um, so then she, she, uh, she started looking through the journals, but she still didn't take to the earlier years. It was still um, female fortune and um, uh, Anne's business life. So um, she tried to push that idea uh, early on in the 2000s, but it wasn't taken up, her proposal wasn't taken up. So she turned to other things, didn't she? All these wonderful series that she's done. Happy Valley and uh, Last Tango in Paris. Uh, in Halifax. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who tangos in Halifax? <laughs> we used to, we used to, didn't we? Um, so uh, a lot of years went by and we sort of lost touch. But then when, um, of course, HBO and BBC uh, did, did pick her proposal up and put all this fantastic money in, um, she's come back into my life, of course. I, I was uh, recruited as a consultant on the film, on the, on the series. So, um, so there we go. We're back in touch again, which is lovely. And, I, and there's series two that's already been yes, commissioned. Yes, series two. Um, yeah. And it's been very, very good. So it was shown in America first. I know. It was aired there. Yeah. And I heard that, and I thought that was because HBO were very powerful, but the chap from the production company, Lookout Point, said, no, it's because Sally Wainwright's very powerful. Yes, she is. And she couldn't wait yes. for it to go out. So they... they Aired it first in uh, America. Oh, right. Apparently. But that went got put Apparently, out first he said she's quite a force to be reckoned with. Oh yes, I know she is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and she gets the detail. Well, that's why your detailed work must have been a treasure for her. Right. So. To see that uh, amount of material for oh, her yes. to go on and on yes. writing yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's. Um, I mean. You, she, she does have Anne Chilmer, who is her, who is her uh, main um, yeah. uh, consultant, if you like. The historical uh, Because consultant. basically, um, what she needs from a consultant is somebody to be on the set all the time with their laptop, yeah? 
and she might have Sir Anne Jones doing a scene and she will say, and she's got the transcript of what she wants her to say, but then she might have to go back and say, can we enlarge on that or could we alter it? Angela, I think you've been through some of that with Sally, haven't you? So you would have to be on the set with your, comp with your laptop and, and you would have to travel down to London and went to Copenhagen. Yeah. Yes. And um, I mean, hey, you know, I'm old. <laughs> I wouldn't have the strength uh, to do that. Uh, or the energy, and so obviously a younger person has to do all that, but uh, that's fine. I'm happy with my, my biography, if it gets taken, and I have to say, the Sailor books has risen astronomically since. These are laying dormant, like our listeners' journals, for 30 years, and, uh, and you know, just selling modestly, yeah, and tiny little royalties. And uh, the first, after the first series in, in the first episode of the first series in America, Zoom, I thought, oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, heck. <laughs> but you, earlier on, your daughter, Rachel, was telling me that you also now get so much email, I know. so many requests, I know. and people then, full of admiration, but they say, oh, could you just tell me oh, what happened? did Anne do on, yeah. like, on your day, yeah. and that you're being extraordinary and replying to every, I, please don't send any emails, <laughs> <laughs> um, that you reply to every single I try, email. I try to, I try to, um, I did have to put the thing out and say, look, you know, I love you all, and it's wonderful, wonderful that I'm getting all these accolades, thousands of them, that I cannot answer every question, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. But then you find it, a question goes on and then they want the answer to the, that bit. Well, what did he buy that and what did she do this? And, and I'm thinking, I've got a biography to get together. But it, it is, it's wonderful that, that people are so appreciative because I think what has surprised me is that I thought um, it would be all to do with Sally, which it is, and, and Anne Chone's brought a book out and we have an author here who's also brought a book out, Angela. <laughs> Uh, and, and they're dealing with the Anne Walker and the Anne Lister story, of course. So um, again, I thought I, I was on the back seat, you see, because I don't, I haven't done that in the same depth. But the curiosity now is, what happened before that? How did this start? Who started it? So I've had, I've had to blow my own cover, <laughs> and of course they come back to me for the origins, shall I say? Yeah of how did this all start. And it started with that day, as I went into the archives, and the guy said, did you know she wrote a journal? <laughs> and I think we have a few minutes before we're going to have tea. So I think, you, I'm sure you've got some questions. Is there any, we could just do a few now, yes. we, couldn't we? Yeah. Is there any, who would like, technician has left the room but if you give me the question I can if yes. Helena doesn't hear I can yes. you said that um, in, in about the 1950s um, they'd stopped from publishing what they'd found who, who stopped that oh well there wasn't the freedom of information act in those days you see um, and so it was up to the up to the shall I say the higher worthies of Halifax town council and that as to what could be published and what couldn't be published they have the veto on it yes were the Rawsons still in? Yes. <laughs> still, I hope there aren't any Rawsons here this afternoon. Yes. Um, in the in the in the television program that uh, just recently, there was uh, uh, an episode where she was physically attacked by uh, oh, yeah. a man on the highway. Is, no. that, is that truth or is that fiction? Um, that is the part fiction. Well. Uh, quite a lot of fiction there. What happened, uh, she was going up the new bank, walking up to Shibden, and it was dark, and she was never frightened. I mean, in those days, no street lights or anything like that. Um, and so she was walking in the dark, up to Shibden, up new bank, and the man ran up and tried to put his hand up her clothes, and she turned on him, and she 
looked at her umbrella and she said, I'll drop you. And, and he said, you wouldn't dare. And she says, well, she didn't say try me, but she said, I will <laughs> drop you. <laughs> and we just ran off. And I think uh, Sally's quite good at making a drama out of incidents like that. Yes, I mean, it wasn't the first time she was attacked. You know, one or two would, they would well, not attack, they would run after her. One man ran after calling, you want a husband, miss? You want a husband? <laughs> you know, she, she, she went, you know, going through town, she would get barracked, as we call it now. You know, what they call it, rough music. You know, men shouting out rude things to her. And, yes, I won't repeat them on. Yeah, the Rawsons, the Rawsons were, uh, Christopher Rawson apparently was perfectly capable of, of organising groups of thugs to shout at her in the street and uh, uh, I think he organised burning an effigy of Anne Lister and Anne Walker in the town, um, you know, and this was all because of the rivalry over the coal business of course, yes, that um, she was determined uh, that he wasn't going to get the better of her and he did admit he said, I've never been beaten by any but a woman, and you've certainly beaten me. <laughs> oh, good. So th those of us who are just watching the series with us here don't know what's going to happen. No, 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 so no there's a lot to come yet. <laughs> yes. yes. We don't want any spoilers. Do we? Yes. Um, anyone more questions? We don't have a microphone working there. take your point that she was seen as promiscuous or even predatory um, but when you I mean I think in the Daily Mail or the Daily Mirror but she had she seduced hundreds of women well I'm sorry where did she get all the energy from for one <laughs> thing yes uh, actually she had um, about five serious love affairs she had Eliza Rain as a, a, a schoolgirl lover uh, Isabella Norcliffe for a little while and then she fell in love with Mariana Belcom. Uh, that affair of course had to go because Mariana Belcom uh, married and then there was um, a, a torrid love affair in Paris with Maria Barlow. She did seduce a young woman called Miss Valence and she seduced two of Mariana's sisters and then the final one with Anne Walker. So eight love affairs, yes, perhaps a little over the top, but <laughs> not anything out of the ordinary, <laughs> too much, I don't suppose, especially as we look at things in this day and age. Um, predatory, I say no, um, because as she said, I never forced myself on anyone and I have never been refused. Um, and the thing is that I have to say that once she actually managed to, um, shall I say, court the girls successfully, uh, they were quite happy, quite happy, <laughs> and came back for more. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, she never uh, preyed on very young women. All these women were in the late 20s, early 30s. Mariana's two sisters were uh, in the late 20s, early 30s. She didn't as the word predatory means, go prowling the streets looking for vulnerable young women. Nothing like that. No, it was always very discreet courting, uh, gradually getting the girls, women's confidence, and gradually persuading them that, hey, you know, nothing can happen. Can't get you pregnant. It's fun. <laughs> and they thought so too. <laughs> Any more questions? 
Well, I think that with Anne Walker, certainly, yes. her vulnerability, oh, yeah. her, she, she saw Anne as the, the one who was going to look after her. Uh, exactly, yes. You see, the thing about um, Anne Walker's career in, in love affairs, um, Eliza Rain, her first, her first love affair, um, eventually she ended up in an asylum. And because Anne Walker also ended up in an asylum, the case, the, the case that, that people make against that mystery is she drives her lovers mad. They all ended up mad. But of course, what you've got to look at is the back history of these women. Um, for instance, Eliza Rain, when her, she was born in India of an Indian mother and, um, and, a, and a white father, and um, the white father, um, Dr. Rain, said that in, in, the, in the occurrence of his death, uh, his two daughters had to be brought over to England. But he, he died on his way over to England. And um, the two little girls were brought over. And at the age of eight, they were taken away from their birth mother. They were taken away from their homeland. They were taken away from their culture. And they were dumped in York with, with the Duffins. And um, of course, that, that is traumatic for any child. Uh, so um, problems, <coughs> mental problems, could have started back then. Because the, uh, the thing is that her, her sister Jane Rain um, also ended up in an asylum. She was heterosexual. So the, the family history and the trauma that those girls suffered uh, could have triggered off um, later mental instability. In the case of Anne Walker, of course, she allowed her friend's husband, Mr. Ainsworth, to seduce her. He was a clergyman, and she felt that she was damned. Uh, and she was so religious, she felt there was no chance of any redemption in the eyes of God. And that set up um, a religious neurosis. And she'd also lost her parents at a young age. Um, again, these troubled women were troubled um, for, from causes other than Anne Lister. And, and Anne Walker certainly found a strong support in Anne Lister, as did Eliza Rain. But of course, when Anne, when Anne wanted um, to move on from Eliza Rain, because it was only a schoolgirl affair, she could move on, but Eliza couldn't. And of course, the mental instability rushed in then. Her, her sister Jane, she was uh, left destitute by her husband, and then her mental instability uh, worked in. So to say that Anne Lister is either predatory or, or, or um, sends her lovers mad, I'm afraid it's um, an exaggeration to say the least. So no, I, didn't, I don't feel antipathy to Anne. I think she was strong, brave, courageous in sticking to her lesbian credo, as I've said, I love and only love the fair sex. She was very curious about her own sexuality. As she wrote to a friend, I am an enigma and I do excite my own curiosity. She couldn't understand why, as a perfectly formed woman, um, why she had the inclination to love her own sex. And she said, no exterior formation accounts for it. It is all a matter of the mind that I am an enigma and I do um, excite my own curiosity. And when you read through the journals and you start exploring how she constructed her lesbian identity in the face of a hostile world, I have nothing but courage, but, uh, sorry, admiration for that sort of courage, really. So, um, no, I have no antipathy to Alice. Is that okay? <laughs> Seduced her while his wife was, was ill, Ill. Ill, and then within minutes after the wife 
died. Right. He is kind of chasing Anne. That's predatory. Presum I, I think that's predatory. And it was very much for her fortune to look at this. Because so there were lots of fortune hunters there were about. I must admit, Anne also had her eye on her fault. She was well. <laughs> <laughs> but she did, I think she did love her in the beginning anyway. I don't want to go into spoilers. No. For what's to come. Um, it's quite interesting. Liz Howe, who's here today, who's our wonderful marketing girl, she's become quite fascinated. I mean, she should be asking you all these questions. Mm -hmm but very much with our own Miss Wadsworth. So Miss Wadsworth lived here, a yes. little bit older than Anne, but they w w there is um, evidence that they knew each other. She certainly knew Anne Walker. Mm -hmm. And I think, Liz, aren't I right, that Miss Wadsworth actually left Anne Walker some money in her mm -hmm. will or something, or the other way, no, other way around? In the Anne Diaries, apparently, um, Anne Lister, is quoted as saying that Miss Wadsworth, Miss Wadsworth on her death um, had a fortune of £700 per year. So that's um, actually in the Anne Lister diary. That was it. So there was, I knew there was money involved. So Anne was obviously interested in yeah. money. Of course, of course. <laughs> and who had what. Yes. And Miss Wadsworth was another unmarried really? woman yeah. living here. We haven't, however much Liz has tried, we can't get them together. She didn't leave, she didn't leave a journal. <laughs> she, she did leave a journal. She did leave a diary. Oh, oh. But it's, n it's not as racy. No. There's a lot to do with what they ate and <laughs> when the vicar <laughs> came. Oh, I know. Yeah. The Wadsworth diary is actually in our archives as well at Halifax uh, Library. And it's been possible to view that the Wadsworth diary is side by side. Um, and obviously, um, actually using Helena's book, um, looking at the dates that um, Anne Lister wrote, and looking at the dates of the diaries of Miss Wadsworth, you can see what she did on each day. Um, but specifically looking at 1821, what they did to Elizabeth Church. Mm. So we've got a rival here for another book, <laughs> <laughs> another diary. Well, I, don't, I hope you haven't got it for 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> Science. She went to Paris. She studied under uh, Cuvier, who, who was the leading uh, scientist of the day in Paris, and um, she read the classics. Um, she studied the classics a lot to find out about um, the history of homosexuality, um, and she was always, always seeking uh, to find some evidence of female homosexuality. Um, she only came across one, really one um, sort of instance, uh, and it was by Juvenal, who was a, a Latin satirist. And in his sixth satire, he wrote um, that two stepsisters had been to an orgy, and they were riding home, they were coming home over by moonlight, and they stopped under the moon, and they rode each other. And that was the only, apart from Sappho, that was the only, um, the only um, symptom or, or indication that female to female homosexuality uh, existed. Um, and she used it as a sort of a tagline, if you like, or an introduction. And if she had a woman in her sights that she rather fancied, she would say, do you know Juvenal's sixth satire? <laughs> <laughs> and the woman said no, so she'd think, oh, forget it, forget it. <laughs> but if they said yes, she'd think, ah, oh, she knows about these things, so she would feel free to flirt with her. <laughs> and it seems that her family, the aunt and uncle, no, her father, sorry, and the aunt, yeah. were very tolerant of her. Yes, yes. Um, 
The aunt was very naive, uh, or, or, or assumed an air of naivety, perhaps she just didn't want to know. But she knew that if, if Mariana ever came to stay, that she would be with Anne in what she called the blue room, yeah? And as opposed to the red room, which was the master room, which Anne inherited, of course, when, when uh, with Anne Walk. And uh, when Anne got the veneer of complaint from um, Mariana, she persuaded her aunt that she picked it up from drinking from the same glass as somebody who had something like that, or sitting at, sit on a toilet seat or something, um, and uh, she, she would accept that. But whether, whether she chose not to know. But of course her uncle, her uncle was wiser. And in fact her, her father, when she was about 17 or 18, I think, he, he was captain in the army and he was a man of the world. And uh, she told Maria Barlow in Paris, my father once brought a person to stay with me, uh, to lie with me, and he would not have us disturbed till, after, till three o'clock the following day. Well, her father, in no man in those days, would have brought a man to sleep with his young daughter and lay with her till three o'clock in the afternoon. So he must have bought, brought a prostitute to, to, to uh, perhaps initiate her, as he thought, into, into sex with a woman. But little did he know that she was already very well in, initiated, actually. So perhaps she could have taught the woman a thing or two. So, uh, but that, that to me signifies that her father and her uncle were well aware of her sexuality, tolerated it, and knew that she would end her life living with a woman, and they accepted it. So that was, that was fine within the family, yes. Of course, Marion, yeah, you oh, get the sister. I yeah. love Marion, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> the sister. She's a really good actress, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And accordingly. Yeah. Let's not forget accordingly. Yeah. No, no, it's very well cast. And yes. I'm very. so good to hear that you feel comfortable oh, with I that do. Oh, yes, I'm really enjoying it. Yes, I am. Um, it, we, Rachel and I were talking about the fact that um, Sir Anne Jones had been Steve, Steve's wife in Coronation Street. <laughs> And also, um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Anne Walker's sister, is that, that's the role she's playing. Uh, and uh, she's, she's been on uh, Steve's Wife. <laughs> yeah, all right. Perhaps I was talking with Eileen. Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, when he says we'll have, to bring, uh, we'll have to bring Anne up here, and he's talking to his wife, and it's, it's the yeah. actress that was yeah, Steve's. Yeah, well, she's worked with him. Yeah, yeah so got something in common there. <laughs> <laughs> but this is how I think um, and, uh, Sally sometimes chooses her actresses from yeah. people. But it, it's the sign of a very good actress that yeah. we can know that she's been in these other programmes, mm. but you completely forget that. She yeah. is Anne Lister. Yeah. She is very much yeah. Anne Lister. Well, Sa Sally, of course, was a Coronation Street writer for five years. Yes. Uh, she, she created the Bathurstbys. Yes, apparently writers create their own families and, and work on their lines. She created the Battersby's. <laughs> <laughs> um, any another question before we have tea? Because I'm sure. Oh. Try and catch this for me. I was just wondering if you can remember what the first passage was that you heard in the city light. What the first the passage first, was. First the very first passage, shall I read it? She's on honeymoon, not hers. Uh, she's on, on honeymoon with Mariana. In those days, uh, when a girl got married and the husband was taking her away from her friends and her family, as Charles did with Mariana, he lived over in, uh, in, in law in Cheshire, um, she would take a friend with her or a sister or, well, Anne Lister, masochistically, went with her <laughs> and so did one of our sisters and they were in Buxton with the honeymooners and um, Mariana and Charles had gone to bed so Anne was feeling very forlorn but um, she started honing in if you like on Anne that was at Nance that was um, Mariana's sister and she says here Anne sat by my bedside till two. I talked about the feeling to which she gave rise to, lamented my fate, 
said I should never marry, could not like men, ought not to like women, at the same time apologising for my inclination that way. By diverse arguments, made out a pitiful story altogether and roused poor Anne's sympathy to tears. And then a couple of nights later, I, con I contradicted all I said last night. I argued upon the absurdity and the impossibility of it and wondered how she could be such a gull as to believe it. She said she had really been very sorry for me and said she thought I hardly behaved well to make such a fool of her. I begged her pardon, etc. But then, a few nights on, um, she, was, she had another uh, intimate uh, meeting with Anne. She says, Anne and I lay awake last night till four in the morning. I let her into my penchant for the ladies, expatiated on the nature of my feelings towards her and her towards me, told her that she ought not to deceive herself as to the nature of my sentiments and the sentiments of my intentions towards her. I could feel the same in at least two more instances and named her sister, Eliza, as one, saying that I did not dislike her in my heart, but rather admired her as a pretty girl. I asked Anne if she liked me the less for my conduct, etc., etc. She said no, kissed me, and proved by her manner that she did not. And then later on, of course, uh, things, um, things get the... Um, Hotter. <laughs> and and uh, Nancy's worried. She asked if I thought the thing was wrong, if it was forbidden in the Bible, and so it goes on. So it's in the book, people. <laughs> so, gentlemen at the back, did you want to ask? And then that, that this will be the last one before tea. Yes. Uh, partly, is it uh, partly sure that I saw it showed the dealing with the Rawson about coal. <laughs> and she was portrayed as a very astute businesswoman. She should tell you what, astute businesswoman. Oh, yeah. Was she, in fact, such a good businesswoman, or was she always in a, a position of power to hold out till she got what she demanded for whatever she had? Is there anything that portrays her as a very, very good businesswoman? Oh, yes. Or was she just in a position of power and had what people wanted and hung out? Yeah, you're talking about her power, her power did situation. She, uh, did she, was she astute, or did oh, she just astute. use her power and her in her family name to yes. get what she wanted? She was, she was in, she was in a very privileged position, of course, uh, owning the land and being able to set the set demands as how other people could use it. And uh, she thought, if Rawson's can uh, make money from coal from my lands, I can make money from coal from my lands. And he had already developed coal mines, of course. And um, but he went, he, she was going to build and uh, develop coal mines above his. So what he did was was um, he flooded her coal mines with water, and you know when he did tricks like that, he he, he put smoking dung into her coal mines and oh. smoked the men out. And but she bet him in the end. Yes, she did. Um, and of course it was it was the fact that she undercut his prices in town. He might sell coal for, uh, threaten to serve coal or whatever, and she would say, I'll tell my son to stay in it, you know, and things like that, yeah? So she definitely had the power and, and the determination. So, um, yeah, she was the... She was. Good yes. to hear. She was a good businesswoman. Yes. Um, right, so we're going to have some tea. And uh, thank you. Thank you. No, I hope all. there'll be a little bit more afterwards. Mm -hmm. about your talk at the Halifax Minster, which yeah. is on the 13th of July. Mm -hmm. uh, but didn't you say it's already all sold out or something? Well, Maybe when we were to it in the town hall, the tickets sold out in 24 hours. <laughs> so they decided that to move it to the Minster where they, were, they could sell more tickets. So uh, what's happened is they've transferred it to the Minster, apparently, or they are going to do within the next week or so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we're continuing this theme at Holdsworth House because in August, and uh, Helen has mentioned Angela Clare, who's sitting here, who is, um, is um, collections manager for the Calderdale Museums, which manage Bank Field and Shifton Hall and other ones I can't remember the names of. But she has also uh, studied at great length and Lister and has written a novel, The Moss House, which is, it is out now, I think, is it, yes. Angela? Yes. <laughs> so that's something else to add to the collection. And um, we're going to do this on Thursday, the 8th of August, with a dinner. And Angela will talk about you know, the, the sort of, um, the legacy as well of Anne Lister and what it's meant, even to us today. And we're going to try and recreate a little, oh, I do hope you'll come, Helen. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're going to try and recreate a little bit. I know many of you will have seen on the TV programme, but they always seem to be having breakfast, mm -hmm. don't they? But they did have tea the other day when the gentleman they don't they disapprove of came. <laughs> and there were sort of jellies and flubberies and things like that. So we're going to try and do not a menu exactly like they would have eaten yeah. because we'd rather not. <laughs> um, too much offal and all that kind of thing. But we'll try and re reproduce it. I've so seen one or two in there, but, but um, absolutely yeah. this is it. I'll we think need to out. yes, but please, yes, please do and make yes. sure it's authentic. Yes. So that's in August, but if you're on our mailing list, we'll be sending that out. And after you've had tea, it would be a pleasure for us if you want to have a look round Holdsworth House, um, look in the, at the front of the house. There are so many similarities to mm -hmm. Shifton Hall, aren't there? Yeah. The panelling, the staircase, the rooms upstairs are now meeting rooms, but yeah. they were the bedrooms. And in the hall, we even have the grandfather clock, which was Thomas Lister. Oh. And I think they've used a very similar one in, uh, uh, in the filming. Mm -hmm. So do have a look, and we'll be back later on for a cup right. of tea. Yes. <laughs>